sure I could have quit in protest, but then there would be a void of a voice and someone to advocate for us. Right now, Joy, in the White House, there is no African-American representation. There are no African-American senior staffers. There are no African-American assistants to the president. And so they're making decisions about us without us. Mm -hmm. Now, people can agree or disagree whether or not there should be representation. I happen to believe there should be. It shouldn't be me because I'm out, but I'll right. tell you that we still need African-American leadership, African-American civil rights leaders to go and fight for the things that are important for advancing our community. That hasn't changed for me. We still need a voice. One of the things that is stirring in the book is you write about what, what really was it for you. Um, that you write about Charlottesville really being a turning point in terms of your perception of Donald Trump, in terms of you, as you said, sort of the cult kind of thing wearing off and sort of waking up. Um, but at that point, that was the summer um, of 2017, you didn't resign. In fact, no one resigned in protest over Charlottesville. Do you now look back and wish that you had? You have a flair for the dramatic, as Donald Trump does. You learn from the best. Had you resigned <laughs> as the only African-American woman staffer in the White House, as the senior mm -hmm. most African-American uh, in the White House other than Ben Carson. If you had resigned, it would have been a tidal wave. Why didn't you resign? Yeah, the reason I didn't resign is because there were a hundred students 100 representatives from historically black colleges and universities. They're called HBCU All-Stars. And I had been preparing this conference that was going to happen in September, the White House Conference on Historically Black Colleges and Universities. And I called Armstrong Williams and I said, I'm going to quit. This is it. I'm done. And he said, you know, you can't let those students down. You've been working. You, you can't just leave and protest. You have to find someone to take your place. You have to find a way to make sure these initiatives are carried out. Just like Gary Cohn, who stayed on after Charlottesville for months and months because he had financial issues on the table. There were issues that were important to me that I couldn't just throw up my hands. Mm -hmm. Sure, I could have left in protest, and yet those students would have never had the experience of a lifetime to come to Washington to see how government works firsthand. I wouldn't have had an opportunity to, to go to the UN. I wouldn't have an opportunity to continue to work on issues of Haiti, of Flint. All of these things that were important to not just throw up my hands and leave. Mm -hmm. But I certainly knew that January 20th of 2018 would be my kicker the end of my time in the White House. Um, unfortunately, as you see in the book, uh, General Kelly decided that the Situation Room would be a better way to end my time in the White House, locking me there and making threats, saying things will get ugly for me and there would be damage to my reputation. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's all in Unhinged. I think it's important for people to read the entire story and not just take little slivers of it because this is my life story and this is a true journey of how I overcame so many obstacles to get where I am today. No, it is a full story. I mean, for, for those who have not read the book yet, um, and it's a bestseller, so a lot of people have already read it, but yeah, you do go through your entire life story. You talk about John Kelly. You open with the firing, with being pulled into the Situation mm -hmm. Room uh, in order for John Kelly to to fire you um, and you write a lot about him do you think John Kelly's racist oh yeah I mean John Kelly thought the Civil War, <laughs> Civil War was about uh, compromise it wasn't about compromise General John Kelly it was about slavery you you also write that John Kelly never met with you that he never had any time of day for you but you also write that you believed at the time that he was firing you that it was because somehow he knew that you knew that there was an n-word tape from from uh, Donald Trump's apprentice days how would he know that if he didn't even interact well, with because you? there's a whole email chain you're the first one to ask me that joy and I'm so glad you asked um, because as, as I've stated everything that's in my book can be cool Operated, it's documented and verified. On that day, the first email I sent that morning was to Hope Hicks, and Hope Hicks has, I mean, the email will become public because they're government emails. I sent an email to Hope explaining to her I was concerned about the chatter. I was hearing that someone was about to release this tape. Hope responds to me, and she says, we've already contained this, or we already dealt with this which I thought was interesting. And because of that exchange, that happened in the morning at 10 a.m. By uh, 5 o'clock, I got an email from John Kelly, uh, assistant, saying that he wanted to meet with me in the Situation Room. It's hard to ignore the coincidence that I had that exchange in the morning, and by the afternoon, he was, or the evening, he was locking me in the Situation Room, making threats. Very interesting. I definitely would love to read um, that email. Yeah, tons <laughs> of emails about that, and the White House knows this. Hope Hicks knows that, and I'm sure John Kelly knows that, I have too. to ask you this question, because you do mention having the emails you've, you've at least some tapes, you have some video and some audio tapes. When you went into the White House, when you took that job, did you have the intention of ultimately writing a book? Is that why you kept so many recordings and made so many recordings? No, my intention was to serve my country. When I took my oath uh, to the Constitution, to this country, I took it very seriously.